Good evening, everyone. I'm Ravi Ramamurthy, Director of the Center for Emerging Markets at Northeastern University. Welcome again for those of you who are returning to this China Insight series. Today is the fifth in that series. And our topic today is the challenges facing Chinese companies going public in the US. If you've been following the news, you know that this is a very interesting and important topic these days. To help us explore this topic, we have two panelists uh, today. The first is David Sherman, who is prof a professor of accounting at the Damore McKim School of Business here at Northeastern University and a faculty fellow of the Center for Emerging Markets. And we are delighted that he's going to be joined today by Len Jui, who is the Asia Pacific Lead on Public Policy and Regulatory Affairs at KPMG based in the US, but traveling all over the world uh, in the context of his work. I'm going to now turn it over to Professor David Sherman. David? Thank you, Ravi. Uh, it's great to be here. And uh, first of all, I want to thank Michael Enright, who did the uh, three or I think it's four sessions. Four. Really creating a four sessions, creating a great foundation that the culture and business issues related to China and US trade and I also especially want to thank Ravi, who created this, this the CEM, the, the, the Center for Emerging Markets, and George Yip, who has really been a very big supporter of this. Uh, we're going to talk about Chinese IPOs today. And uh, these are organizations that are very profitable. They're very strong management. Uh, they're growing in a very fast growing economy, but there's a lot of conflicts affecting them. And uh, the, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how to improve their, their operations. You can move to the next slide, by the way. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about really how, how to improve their operations, and uh, that will include how to build investor confidence, how to communicate and translate their business models for fair valuation, and also what the roles of the professionals, the boards, the attorneys, the auditors, and investors, investor relations people are in this process. Um, so. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, so I, I, you heard I'm a professor of management at, uh, at, at the Morva Kim School of Business. I've also taught at many other places. I was at, at Sloan School before this and HBS and NCIAD and taught around the world quite a bit. Um, and, uh, uh, and getting ready for today, by the way, I, um, uh, I know some of you see me here and I have no tie on. I, was trying to find a YouTube to help me remember how to tie a tie. I haven't won, won one for a year, so I just didn't, didn't work. But in any case, uh, I, my background is I'm a director. I've been a director of quite a number of companies. Right now, I'm a director of five companies. Three of them are Chinese that recently went IPO, one US company and one SPAC. I've recently been a director of seven companies and uh, advisor to more than 10 Chinese companies trying to go IPO. And then I spent some time at the SEC uh, where I was very fortunate to meet Len Jui. We were both met at the SEC. Um, my research is on shareholder reporting, uh, audit committees, all that kind of stuff. You see, I have a whole bunch of HBR and Sloan articles and uh, books on this topic in case you want to read more about it. Uh, and I have been a C CFO of a couple of organizations. So that's kind of my background. And at this point, let me turn it over to Len to talk a little bit about his background. Thank you, Len. Thank, thank you, David, and, and thank, you, thank you everyone who are joining the call and I really appreciate the uh, invitation from Northeastern Universities. And I, I do know that there are a number of people dialing from uh, Australia and uh, Europe as well, so, uh, so welcome. Uh, so just quickly uh, talk about my background. Uh, I'm, I'm at the uh, IWSB, International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board. I'm, I'm currently a, a deputy chair for that, that uh, Standard setting board, the IWSB uh, writes standards for the global audit profession. So every single audit uh, has been done in, in the world has a footprint of the, the IWSB. Uh, I'm also a partner with KPNG and among our global um, oversight committees and steering group on a number of issues, uh, particularly on public policy and, and regulatory. I also work closely with uh, uh, some of the largest uh, uh, global networks as well, uh, the PwC, NC Young, Deloitte, and, and others. And, and today, uh, I'm actually very happy to, to, to share uh, some of my, my experience working in, in China, 
Uh, but most more recently, it's uh, uh, listing committee members on the, uh, China's uh, emerging uh, stock market. It, it's a, there's a standard, there's a uh, offering board called the Chinex Board at the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, which which have been involved in the last 12 months. Then, then more importantly, as David said, uh, I spent a, a, a fair, fair number of years at the SEC uh, reviewing and, and uh, going through IPO uh, filings and, and also working with uh, regulators uh, around the world. So uh, happy to share uh, some of the experience in the regulatory and also the SEC experience today. Uh, the next slide, please. So uh, just, just quickly, I want to just talk about uh, China. We, we all know, I mean, many of you know that China is a huge country, large populations, 25% of the, uh, the, the world's population uh, sits in China. In, in fact, a China a Census Bureau just released the population number. Uh, it's it's a, it's a 1.4 billion uh, at the moment. Uh, Despite that, that large number, the, 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 the birth rate has been decreasing at, at the very alarming pace. Um, so th there's a number of issues also uh, uh, press releases recently talk about how that may impact the uh, overall Chinese society and also the workforce go going forward. But I want to talk about the next slide, uh, please. So, so we don't, China has 25% of the world's population, but I want to just highlight that uh, uh, it has one quarter population, but it actually has 40% of civil servants uh, in, in the world. Um, I, I just want to draw some contrast is uh, the, 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 Ch the Chinese uh, uh, history and uh, the Chinese uh, political system, the Chinese society overall, through the evolution of, uh, you know, as, as we know it uh, for 4,000 years, it's very much a centralized uh, planning and centralized um, controlled society. So civil servants, government play an important role. This is not, this is not a, a um, how do I say, we're not judging the political system or the um, social system. It's just that uh, this is a society that's evolved from Thousands of years, and government has important role. If you if you go back to uh, the Chinese history, the, the government the, the government needs to be strong at central level because it's a huge country with a, a lot of uh, local, regional, jurisdictional differences and similarities. So you do you do need to have a, a strong government. So so just want to highlight that that forty percent number. Um, I read about it. Uh, uh, <laughs> A few years ago, from uh, another internet source, it just highlighted that uh, the role of the government uh, plays in, in, in economy, as well as the capital market, which we'll, we'll talk about today. Uh, next slide, please. With, with that diversity and, and huge society, I just want to highlight that China is a huge country. So, some, sometimes we uh, talk about China in singular sense, but it's very much uh, need to focus on if you if you look at China. Pretty much the size of Europe, so so the economy within China, different different regions and and provinces, it, it, sometimes you have to dig further, try to try to dissect regionally some of the differences and and also uh, varying stage of uh, economic growth and also some of the culture that, that might be different within each region. So so as you can see that uh, if you look at China, it it could be uh, separate into uh, by by country. This 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 uh, this uh, chart is kind kind of uh, old, but uh, just want to just want to highlight that. For example, if you look at the city of Beijing, which is growing really fast, but the GDP for Beijing is the size of Philippines. That that was ten years ago. In today in today's term, Be Beijing has grown faster than Philippines in, in the last ten years. And, and if you just look at Hong Kong, you know. 10 years ago was the size of the economy for the entire country, Egypt. But, but, but now that even for Hong Kong in the last 10 years, the GDP growth is at the pace that's faster than the growth of the country of e Egypt. So, 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 so forth. So this is just give you uh, some, some context in terms of size of the economy. And, and also um, the GDP growth, when we look at China, you, you tend to look at a number 8%, 6%, uh, post COVID, pre, pre COVID, but if you if you want to dig further, including some some of the topics we're going to talk about today, the companies in China from different regions, 
they they might have different uh, GDP uh, factors and the underlying uh, indicators that, that might impact uh, how we look at Chinese companies as well. Next slide, please. So this is another slide. I just want to show that uh, the, the the growth has uh, taken place uh, over the last thirty years. If you look if you look at the globe, of course, U.S. and, and China are the two biggest biggest economies. But when you analyze the trading partners, you, you look at China is already the biggest trading partners for two thirds of the countries on, on earth. And, 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 and US of, of course is, is continues to be the largest economy, but the number has been shrinking uh, in the last uh, 10, 10 years. If, if you look, look at the entire continent of Africa, if you look at uh, regionally within Asia Pacific, uh, China is pretty much the largest trading partners in, in those two continents, right? Then if you look at Europe, this, this is where, where we're going to be watching it very closely in, in the next decade is who is going to be uh, from trade perspective uh, in terms of uh, the, the European relationship because trade relationship economy was also impact polit politically as well. So this is something that it's not just uh, looking at trade numbers, but trade also impacting uh, politics, uh, impacting uh, regulatory. So the reason I'm focusing on this is because I mean, public policy and regulatory, when you look at the uh, statistic from the economic uh, perspective that, that usually lead to uh, regulatory pol political changes uh, down the road, particularly in foreign policies. Uh, ne next slide, please. So the, so, the, so this, this slide I just want to show that the, I talk about the government uh, has a huge say in terms of economic growth and state planning. This, this just, just, want, just want to show you that, you know, uh, you know, 18 years ago, there were, you know, three subway lines uh, in, in Beijing. Uh, next slide, please. So 18 years later, we have 14 subway lines. And, and I'm, I'm using Beijing as an example, actually it's not fair because uh, I have another slide showing that similar type of uh, infrastructure building has taken place is all over China, it's in other cities. The, the cities we never heard of before in, in the US have, have uh, you know, uh, airports, um, uh, high-speed railway, uh, subway lines. Uh, so the, 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 the government uh, is, uh, using infrastructure buildings in terms of to uh, promote growth of economy. Without infrastructure, it, it's hard to uh, feel the growth of a, a Chinese economy. I think this is something that China has done very well in terms of state planning for infrastructure, is you, you basically building a super highways of, uh, in terms of transportation, in terms of uh, digitally in internet te technology, uh, bring people together. I, I talk about the, the Chinese history has been a divided society over the last three, 4,000 years. Having infrastructure linking uh, regional, uh, regional government, regional societies, and, and also promoting trade is, is very important. So uh, the, 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 the slides to, to show how fast Beijing has grown in terms of infrastructure, infrastructure just to demonstrate that uh, the pace of the growth and also the the um, very very uh, well thought planning has done by the Chinese central government uh, in the last uh, uh, 18, 18 years. So with, with that, I'll turn over to to David. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, so you know, as Lynn was mentioning, there's a huge amount of investment going on in China. Uh, Michael Enright had in these previous discussions talked about the Belt and Road and the uh, uh, making RMB a national, a international currency, and 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 for example, the, uh, the the wealthy middle class of China is equal to the number of people in America. So that's why you have all these luxury goods going up in China. But the point is that all this investment from China really is a great opportunity for U.S. companies because all that investment requires services and products from the U.S. and other companies. So that that's, that's really part of it. And then part of it is that here in the US to really compete, we're actually spending more time trying to sort of catch up on some of these things like the 5G and whatever. So that really the, there's opportunities all, all over for this. And, uh, 
And it, while it's not necessarily a matter of competition, they, some people say, and no matter what the U.S. does, China is always 12 or 13 hours ahead of us. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so what are the benefits of being an IPO? Um, well, Chinese companies don't do it for many, many different reasons, but uh, a lot of it's really to get capital, to grow, to acquire, to enter new markets, and they have a huge local market. Um, some, I think, do it to develop a wealth base outside the U.S. Um, to expand their customer base uh, and gain visibility and also prestige. One of the companies I was visiting, uh, I got to this little town of 4 million people. They're driving me through the town and there's banners all over the place. Uh, and it seemed like maybe it's the July 4th festival or something. And of course, I don't read Chinese, so I didn't know what it was. So finally, as we were approaching the, uh, the, the, the headquarters of the company, I said, so where were all these banners? They said, they're celebrating that we're the first company to go public in this 4 million people city. And the next day, it was like a huge, you know, all the politicians and the party, everybody was there celebrating. That's, there's a lot of prestige and being the company that's public helps them attract visibility to get other customers. Yet, there's a lot of cost to being an IPO. It's extremely costly, much more costly than no matter how much people describe it, it's worse than people think it is, particularly than uh, these, the Chinese uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, and of course, there's all kinds of, there's very significant compliance requirements, which, uh, you know, become really something they have to pay attention to and really don't realize necessarily at, right, right at, at first. So there are some negatives. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so what, about, what do these look like? One thing about Chinese IPOs, at least the ones you see, I've, I have a limited, you know, maybe 20 or 30. They're very profitable. They're really profitable and they're really generating cash. In the US, you don't have to be profitable to go public. Uber and DoorDash, you can't imagine when they're going to be profitable. Um, Chinese companies um, are, really should attract investments from US investors. They, they, they're very attractive. They may not be the highest growth, but they're very profitable and very solid. However, Investors do question them because there has been some issues about financial reporting, some distrust of management, uh, and that can interfere with getting a fair valuation. Uh, it is the case that there were some past frauds. There were maybe 25 frauds that you know created a cloud over them. So companies I was I was dealing with, no matter how strong we were and how clear we were trying to get our message out, we never really felt we got a fair valuation. And I even got up close to one of those because one of these bona fide frauds, they invited me to become the chairman of the audit committee uh, to clean up the fraud after the investigation was done, which is quite an experience. Uh, so the result is that, um, that there, are, there is this perception. In addition, there's a lot of scrutiny. Uh, you'll hear from Glenn about some of the audit issues that they raise questions about the ability to do audits in accordance with US standards. They're delisting companies because they allegedly have government associations. And there are, there are requirements now that US board members beyond these companies. There's a lot of additional requirements and the high standards of the US system does create confidence, but also it creates hesitation. Uh, next slide, please. So there's an expense and there's a lot of a scrutiny, but there are a lot of IPOs, there's over a hundred Chinese companies that are preparing to IPO, nobody can really know how many, but it, easily it's over 100. They're accelerating. The first three quarters of 20, uh, 2020 was 30, and that was more than in 2019. But in China, they're also becoming much more attractive because the, the, the compliance and these other messages that we're sending is forcing some of these companies to go to China. And you may know, for example, that Alibaba really wants to go to Hong Kong first it was only because of, uh, well, they ended up here really as a second choice. Uh, and the Shanghai Star Exchange, um, which only started in 2019, has had more IPOs than the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, and Hong Kong individually. Um, so the, uh, the, one of the problems is that business practices in China really are not understood completely in America. And I keep using the word translation, but it's way, way beyond the question of really language. Um, we go to the next slide. Okay. So uh, at this point, I think I'm going to uh, let Len 
take over and talk a little bit about some of the um, background issues that are pressuring these IPOs and, and politics and auditing and whatever. So, Len? Yeah, th thank you, David. So I, I just uh, want to share a few observations from um, uh, in terms of my role at KPNG, also uh, previously at the SEC in, in looking at the Chinese companies listed in the US. Uh, a lot of time people ask me, what, what, why do Chinese companies want to uh, list in the US? Well, number one, uh, some, of the, some of the Chinese companies are backed by investments from the US. Uh, some, some of the venture capitalists, uh, angel investors, uh, some of the seed money that, that's helped to set up the companies in China are funded by US investors. So, so naturally, um, as an exit strategy uh, for the investors, um, you know, U.S. is, is probably uh, a good way to go. There's a foreign a foreign currency control issues, uh, so uh, having having your shares listed in the U.S., uh, have, having uh, your, your cash proceeds uh, by by offloading your shares in the U.S. capital market resolve that currency issues also benefit the the, the U.S. Uh, in, investors. So 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 we see some of that, but also in certain industry sectors because the regulatory hurdles in, in China, um, it, it probably more, make more sense to list overseas. Uh, in, in, in the last 20, 30 years, uh, I've, I've been involved in the China IPO since 1992, almost 30 years. So from, from, the, from the early stage, you, you have the traditional manufacturing infrastructure sectors, so you, you have the evolving into uh, technology sectors and service sectors. So, D different industry regulator, also the Chinese capital market regulator, <clears throat> because of uh, state planning, uh, economy, e economic considerations, they, they look at each ind individual uh, in uh, sectors uh, differently in terms of uh, uh, I IPO approval potentials. Where, where the US is more transparent, uh, the, the SEC doesn't prejudge uh, in industries. So, so uh, some of the industry sectors are more attractive uh, outside uh, China. Uh, for example, some of the agriculture sectors are, are well received in, uh, uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, some of the education uh, sectors that might be well received in the US but not in China domestically. And, and, and also, <clears throat> the, the, also there's a, a few, a few uh, situations when I see is some of the Chinese owners, they, they like uh, using the IPOs as uh, ways to shifting their personal assets overseas. Uh, as I mentioned that foreign currency is tight, tightly controlled, there are other regulations. And, and, and as for, for per personal uh, preferences, uh, some, some of the owners, funders, they, they would like uh, uh, using the IPO to, uh, as, as a way to um, transfer their, some of their assets overseas. Then there are other companies clearly with the expansion, global expansion in mind. Once you have shares uh, in, in the US, you, you, can, um, you can conduct mergers acquisitions using uh, shares you have, uh, rather than uh, having to spend cash uh, buying companies or facilitate business combinations. Then, then lastly, uh, US regulatory oversight. Uh, this is something I'm very passionate about, uh, having spent a lot of time at the ACC is, I think you know, when we look at the capital market regulation, regulatory oversight, the, the US uh, through uh, you know, our own history, 1933, 1934 act, uh, our, our evolution of oversight is, uh, is actually envy of the world. In, in my previous audit, the SEC, I spent a lot of time working with uh, 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 capital market regulator. The, the, the way our, our, our capital formation and also uh, achieving the balance between regulations and, and market economy uh, is very much uh, preferred uh, by, by a number of uh, um, um, investors and public interest uh, uh, communities. So, so some of the Chinese companies feel that uh, having a regulatory oversight uh, from the US actually is a, a, a good way to go in terms of uh, uh, promoting uh, Better corporate governance and, and, and management uh, in, in China. On governance, uh, I'm going to just uh, quickly talk about this. I know David is going to uh, dig into the governance issue uh, a bit further uh, later in this presentation. 
But one thing I want to draw the difference is the, the difference between the governance uh, uh, structures in, in China versus uh, in, in the US. In, in the US and, and parts of uh, Western Europe and, and Australia, New Zealand, uh, we, we have a similar type of uh, governance structure. You have the auto committee board of directors on top. Uh, Saben RCS section 301 uh, has the uh, legal statutory uh, uh, responsibility for, for the board directors and, and other committees. And other countries have the similar uh, re requirements and legal responsibility as well. But, but, in, but in China, that uh, uh, this is one thing that the, the Chinese uh, uh, securities law uh, regulations uh, recently has been focusing on, but it's, a, it's an evolution process because you have to think about some of the companies are privately owned seeking uh, IPO. So um, there's not a framework uh, for them to set up uh, a governance structure that might be best practice shared by, by US and Western uh, literatures. But, but for Chinese uh, own specific characteristic, there, there might be some of the differences. There might be some pra practical challenges. Also state-owned enterprise uh, uh, is another example that you have uh, the, the the national uh, state uh, assets uh, commission that's overseeing some of the state-owned enterprises. They set up a supervisory board on top of the uh, uh, regular board and other committee as well. So how how that interplay is also a, a challenge to to understand the, the differences. Then then in, in many of the privately owned enterprises, the management and board directors are pretty much the same people because uh, despite the IPO, um, majority of shares are still owned by, by the management. It's different from the US. One, in many situations that institutional investors own most of the companies. Uh, on the focus on, on the environment as well. Uh, in, environment, uh, environment pressure, uh, because it's a state-owned prime economy, the, the, the promoting um, uh, private enterprises to, to expand, uh, you know, GDP growth is very important in China. So, so local government, central government um, uh, are using a capital market to fuel the economy. So this is different from uh, a capital market in, in, in the US. You know, the company has to be ready to be a public company in, in the US. Whether in China, there's a, a the pace is faster uh, because the growth of the economy and the focus on GDP growth uh, it require a lot of cash infusion into uh, enterprises to grow. And, and capital market is, is a way to uh, address some of the cash flow issues. Uh, but the borrowing money in China is not, is not easy. Uh, banks are owned by, by the government. Um, you, 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 we, we might have differences in, in, in terms of looking at fiscal policies in, in, the, in Western Europe, US versus China. There's, 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 there's no right answer, who's doing the, which, which model is right, which model is wrong. But, but uh, 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 for emerging economy, uh, uh, China's uh, tighter fiscal policy, cash management is, is actually, um, as, far, as, as far as I can, I can reflect, I, actually, it fits, it fits for the purposes in, in China, but, but, but we may not have a different uh, uh, concept, a different uh, framework as we know in, in the West. So, so capital market, uh, promoting domestic capital market, also promoting company go overseas to list, very much a, a, a liquidity issues as well as cash flow issues. And also the way uh, the economy has been, been planned uh, from, from a central planning perspective versus a free market perspective. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I want to talk about some of the uh, US-China regulatory issues, uh, just drawing uh, some of the new recent development and, and also uh, my, my, my past experience at the SEC uh, as, a, as a reviewer. Um, one of the things is that the choice of uh, accounting standards. Um, uh, the, the US gap as we know it, uh, it, it's, it's our crown jewel of our uh, other accounting profession in, in the US, but US GAAP is not used uh, uh, widely globally. Uh, globally, there's an international financial reporting standards. And the Chinese uh, accounting standard is very much, uh, um, uh, I, I would say, convergence, uh, almost equivalent to the international standards. 
So when a Chinese company prepared uh, to, to do IPO in the US, uh, so sometimes we, we, we question the choice of accounting standards. I, I know the US company have the US, US gap, but the SEC has allowed foreign private issuers such as a Chinese company to, to list in the US using IFRS. So if you look, if you look at from a cost benefit effective, uh, cost benefit analysis, it actually make more sense to, to use uh, IFRS uh, for Chinese company or even Chinese gap with the reconciliation to list in the US. But, but we wonder why Chinese companies continue to spend a lot of time and money try to um, uh, reconcile the, the numbers in, in US gap, gap for US listing. You could, you could make an argument that because the investors in the US are more familiar with the US gap, but the um, majority of the companies from, from, um, from Japan or you know, other countries in Asia Pacific or Western Europe, they, they're having uh, successful IPOs and listing in the US using IFRS. So, 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 so when, you, when you present your financial statement using US gap, the SEC actually load, uh, look at it uh, very closely because uh, the SEC is the authority in the U.S. gap. So by, by presenting IFRS, uh, as, as I um, may say that IFRS is allowed in the U.S., but the SEC doesn't have jurisdiction over IFRS. So from, from a review perspective, uh, even though that, that the same approach, but, but the, 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 the SEC staff uh, look at U.S. gap financial statement more more closely. Uh, and another thing we, 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 we it's, it's a related to the first bullet is the qualification of the people doing the uh, financial statement, also the, the auditors, because you're using US GAAP. The, the SEC uh, in the earlier comments is, who are these people pre preparing US GAAP? In, in China, are there uh, qualified US CPA with the US CPA license? Are they AI CPA members? The auditors, um, uh, you know, uh, doing audits all the way in China and, and Chinese auditors, do they have a US CPA qualification? So because the choice of financial statement, it led to questions about the qualification experience of the professional who are preparing the financial statements and also doing the audits. Then uh, the, the, the other three bullets about under the financial reporting issue is, um, uh, I think Dave is going to talk about it, is uh, how, how the company presents their risk factor how they describe the business and, and also management discussion and analysis. U US is based on a transparency-based uh, disclosure uh, model. Uh, whether in, in other countries, uh, transparency is important, but transparency can be interpreted differently in different countries, different jurisdictions. So, so from, from, from the disclosures that, uh, uh, from, from the US perspective, US investor, uh, uh, expecting full transparencies. So this, this uh, may lead to uh, some of the differences uh, that David talked about previously. It's not just about translation of languages. It's a translation of how to present information and disclose the information. And that's the biggest area where the SEC common letters have been coming from in the last few years. And, and on the other issues, uh, um, some has, uh, uh, many probably uh, on this call have, uh, read a news release, uh, the PCOB is, is unable to inspect the work papers uh, uh, in, in China. Uh, that two different, uh, two different issues. One is the Chinese company invested in the US. The, the, all the documentations are sitting in China. The other one is the multinational, US multinationals they have significant subsidiaries in China. For example, Pepsi, General Motors, Boeing and, and others. Uh, they, they all the work papers are also sitting in China. So PCOB <clears throat> is unable to inspect the, the, the audit quality of the firms and the auditors perform those audits. So that has been an issue um, for, for the last 15 years. And, and uh, it's, it's still no, no uh, light at the inner tunnel in terms of uh, in the last 15 years of uh, negotiation that uh, PCOB has not been able to uh, agree on a process going forward in terms of uh, mm -hmm. uh, inspecting the work paper in China. Um, just want to highlight that it's not China doesn't allow uh, uh, PCOB into China to inspect. China doesn't allow any country, including Hong Kong, all the regulators come to China to inspect all the work paper. So, so, so um, 
for Hong Kong regulatory authority, they have to rely on the uh, regulatory uh, oversight of the Chinese uh, regulator to do some of the uh, uh, cooperations in, in looking at the auto work paper. So it's not discriminating against uh, US. China doesn't have any deal in place with anyone, including uh, Hong Kong. Uh, uh, the, there are a number of uh, cross-border arrangements between countries. I, I personally been uh, involved in at least a hundred of them, looking at different different arrangement. Uh, there's there's a, a full reliance. There's a mutual recognition. There's also the PCLB uh, have to do the inspection themselves. So uh, China, China and, and and the US just have to find a, a a way between those models to come up with a solution going forward. And but but also importantly is the uh, quality of the firm that provide all the services. Um, some of the uh, Earlier days, reverse merger, some spec deals are done by small firms, and, and the SEC PCLB have been focusing on uh, quality in terms of smaller firms, whether they have the right experience and knowledge to provide those services in China. Also, PCLB and the SEC are aware that U.S. auditors cannot just fly into China to perform audits. Uh, there's a special uh, requirement licensing uh, in China when you are auditors in foreign countries. You cannot just take use a, a tourist visa to come to China to perform audit. So, so there's all the issues uh, dealing with that between China and the US in terms of who are these people flying into China to do the audits. The, the, the largest uh, global uh, networks of accounting firms uh, operate differently. They have uh, member firms in China that perform the audit. But, but the SEC and PCLB beg the question, who are the small firm outside the largest network? Who are these people doing audits uh, in China? And then that leads to the responsibility of a principal auditor because the opinions are assigned by firms in, in, in the US, but they don't do the work. They might contract somebody to fly into China or a local auditors in China to do the work. So I try to figure out the responsibility between the people signing the audit opinion and the people who are doing the work. And lastly, this is a, a, a continued uh, evolution of the a, a politic uh, <laughs> between US and China. There's a, a law passed by US Congress late last year, Donald Trump signed into law in December. The SEC issued the interim rule and the PCLB will have a open meeting tomorrow morning, US time, if you are awake, you, you can dive into the PCLB uh, open discussion on, on this matter is uh, if PCLB is not continue to be uh, forbid from inspecting the audit work paper in, in China, uh, the triggers a certain uh, disclosure requirement, also suspension of trading. And, and this, this is clearly uh, important issues need to be uh, 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 addressed because uh, we continue to see a large number of uh, Chinese IPO in the US in the first quarter of 2021. Uh, you know, there's um, a few dozen, more than a couple dozen of US IPOs uh, down in, 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 in the US. And also when we're looking at the pipeline, speaking to uh, some of the uh, auto firms in China, there's, there's a long line of uh, Chinese company waiting to uh, file IPO uh, uh, from, from China. So, so clearly this has to be addressed. The, 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 the act itself, it talks about uh, you know, the, the, it won't kick in until three years after PCOB can, cannot uh, perform inspection. So uh, depending when the, when the SEC said the, the, the date and the PCO, uh, the SEC said the date that PCOB uh, categorized th those firms. Uh, so we're looking at um, some of the immediate disclosure requirement that kicks in, talk about uh, disclosing ownership, uh, governance structure that might have Communist Party participations. But the suspension of trading will probably won't kick in until three years later, depending on these uh, when when the clock starts ticking. So one one thing we need to focus on there's a difference between suspension of trading versus delisting. So people automatically think the suspense, suspension of trading means delisting. That should is is, is, is a there's a difference. Uh, you can be a listed company in the U.S. without trading. Um, so so that that gets really technical. So. Uh, we, we probably need the securities lawyers uh, to, to participate in future sessions when we talk about the difference between suspension trading versus delisting from, from a US capital market. 
uh, everybody is trying to figure yeah. out what's going to happen next, but I just want to focus on, we don't know. I think uh, politics, regulatory um, uh, factors and, and, and other consideration will come into play. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, to, to watch and observe in the coming uh, three months in terms of how the SEC and PCLB address those interim rules. So David, you, you, you have a question? Yes. No, no, I, I just want to pick up. The... Go ahead. Uh, you, you, you've, you've clarified exactly how complicated this is. And what's interesting is that from this perspective of a person running a, a small business in China, they don't understand what this is PCAOB stuff is because that we have our auditors, we're doing our stuff and whatever. So let me, let's, let me talk about these IPOs and I'll try not to mention, uh, I'll, I'll say some things about these companies. I hope uh, some of those people from those companies don't mind. I won't mention your names, but um, they are, as, as Len mentioned, these are many traditional industries, many traditional industries, but there's a lot of innovation too. In fact, in 2016, there were 9 million patents, trademarks, and copyrights registered in China. That's about nine times as many as the US. So a lot of these companies are really very innovative, but a lot of them also are very traditional, like the largest meat company is owned by a Chinese company. Um, and the companies are very profitable. The first time I met a Chinese, I visited a Chinese company, the auditor told me they have poor internal controls. And what does that mean? It means, well, if you're looking at it from a standpoint of trying to understand the data, you're saying, well, that means you can't trust the data. Well, I found out that, well, that was not exactly the case. It's true, they had internal, didn't, have, didn't have internal controls that we think of as the, from the accounting standpoint, but their operational controls were in, incredible. They knew where every penny went, they were running the, best, the business extremely well. Uh, it's, it was really just a, a different matter altogether. So actually the, the, these entrepreneurs, these managers are really excellent managers. It's just that they don't really know our system and they have to adopt our, our other requirements like the internal controls. And, as far as entrepreneurship, uh, some said that uh, Shenzhen is, uh, could be the most entrepreneurial place in the world. Um, and then as, uh, as Len mentioned, most of these, many of these companies are really almost half the stock or maybe even more of it is owned by the manager and saying, gee, why can't I do what I want to do? And they have no experience with public companies. So we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, so the challenge is that they don't understand what they're doing wrong because they're, they're just doing things which are normal. So let me give you a couple of examples. I get a call from the auditor one day and said, did you know what happened uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the loan? I said, what loan? They said, well, around December 28th, the company made a loan to another business. Oh, really? Well, did it get repaid? Yes, it got paid around January 3rd. Oh, so the good news is the money's all there. Okay. Um, the bad news is it's December 31, which means not only uh, it does it not look good, but it's going to be on the financial statement on December 31. And then they said, and do you know how much the loan is? How much? $52 million. So this is not illegal, but it's a transaction. And the managers had a friend who needed some cash to, for his own company's coverage. And, you know, what can you do? Uh, so that th this is an innocent kind of thing, but it happens all the time. And uh, on earnings calls, they mentioned things that they never mentioned before. Uh, this company had been looking at creating sort of an, a, a, a sort of a, a, a park for the, their industry, and uh, and they had just taken us for a ride to visit the park. And when I got home, I measured what it was, and I compared uh, some hectares or something into miles. And it turns out the park was actually going to be four miles by four miles. And the CEO decides at the earnings call to mention we're looking at this park. Anyway, the point is. Um, that these things don't look good, but they're not really meant to be anything negative, but they just don't understand them. So the first thing is that the IPOs need to develop trust that and, and, a, and a trust in terms of public perception as well as what they're doing. And they really are usually not doing anything where they're trying to create a problem. They, 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 there's a need to, to somehow get them to uh, accept the fact that this is a serious matter uh, and to be successful, they have to sort of stay alert to this. They have to uh, realize every little thing they do as a divergence is going to be watched very carefully because they're always waiting to see, is this going to be another one of those ones, which is a, a problem from China? Um, and uh, so maintaining that trust and is, is a really key issue and a key focus. Um, and again, just because something doesn't look good doesn't mean it was intended to be a problem, but these things unfortunately do happen pretty often. 
So one of the questions is, what do you do about this? And of course, there's been efforts time and time again, and I try and everybody tries to deal with this, but there is really a need for this. And, and it's, I think that part of it is the professionals need to really understand that they don't understand. Uh, and while it's nice to really tell them what these rules are, when you just tell them, it doesn't really necessarily sink in. It doesn't necessarily prevent the issues. So in a sense, you need more of an aggressive act in terms of the professionals. I'm talking about really the accountants, the lawyers, the investor relations, and the uh, and the board members. Um, and but it's but all that effort does cost money, uh, and th they don't really like paying those professional fees. But it's really worth it because once you get that trust the value will come back. And without that, uh, these companies really are being undervalued, even though they're extremely profitable and potentially really great investments. Um, could you go to the next slide? Next, thank you. So the other issue is the um, translating their business. One hand, that you know they don't understand all the compliance requirements and really maybe doing things which don't really look good. But the other part is getting the story across Get, which is actually sounds obvious that they should be translating their business model into the U.S. investor's view, but for various reasons, it doesn't seem to work. And let me just give you a couple of examples. Um, one cosmetic company, we had a shareholders meeting, and the CEO was there, and he was and he would he had a translator, and next to me was a Chinese investor who brought me into this whole thing, and he was he was bilingual. Uh, and they asked the uh, CEO, why do people want your product? And he, and he said, you know, it's because, uh, because really Chinese women really like this product. And this, this person explained to me, he said, you know, that was really not the right story. It's like saying, why do people like uh, suntan lotion? Because they love the aroma of that chemical. No, it's because they need it. Um, that the ex explanation was really inadequate and really in, 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 incomplete. Uh, another case, uh, actually a very uh, dear friend of mine, a really great uh, China expert and really one of the uh, smartest lawyers I know, a guy named Silic Sachs, he called me up one day and said, you know, your company just issued a press release. I said, yeah, I know that. Um, but they didn't tell me first, but it, it's a press release, yeah. Oh, yeah. He says, let me ask you something. Was that press release good news or bad news? That is a, I hope, let me say this again. You pick up the press release and you don't know, is it good news or bad news? The people in China don't know exactly how it's being translated. The investor relations firm has done something and you can't even tell why this is, obviously it was done to be good news, but you can't even tell why. And just let me give you one other example, which is think about buying a condominium in America. Picture it. Picture you walk into the, into the room, you see a kitchen, you see living room, dining room. Uh, so picture that, go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Hello. Uh, um, can we get the next slide? I'm not sure if uh, I may have, I can probably bring it up myself. This is the picture of what you get when you buy a condominium in China. And when the person picks it up in America, they don't realize you're just getting bare walls. The, the bare walls means that if you're producing these condos in China, you can turn them over so fast, the day that you're done, the next day, everybody in the whole building is, takes ownership. Then they bring in their own group to do this analysis. So the, the translating that business to the US investor is, is missing. Uh, so many times when you read what they do, what you realize is this is really not conveying the story completely. So one of the, so I guess I, I would say that we have sort of a few messages. One of them is that, you know, that they're really excellent managers. They know exactly what they're doing. They know how to create a pro profitable business. They are profitable. They know how to take advantage of strategic opportunities and they, have, they know how to create all the connections they need to in the country, but they have to develop credibility and trust in the US to attract those investors to get a fair value and to get the kinds of capital that you heard that they need. Um, they have to translate that business model to actually accurately reflect 
the Chinese business culture and the actual and the business model. Um, and only then would the investor be able to give a fair valuation. Uh, somebody looking at that at this construction company wouldn't realize how quickly they can turn out those those condominiums because they don't have to wait for people who go in and say, gee, you know, if I have a punch list that's about a thousand items. You have to get through these first before I'll take possession. The, the fair valuation requires that people understand what it is. And finally, what I guess I would say is that I've been a director, you know, I've I've been an auditor, <laughs> I've been, I've worked with a lot of attorneys and, uh, and work with IR firms. I think we just need to be much more proactive, much more focused, um, and actually, uh, you know, sort of lead the process. And as soon as there is something that looks like to be an issue to sort of jump in and really try to remedy it uh, quickly and that, don't let go until it's done. Because once the reputation is damaged, it's very hard to turn around. So I guess I feel these are the things that uh, I've taken from this uh, that I think are, would actually help make those potentially really valuable IPOs really fully valuable and actually reach their, their true value in the market. So at this point, I think uh, we're willing to take some questions. Thank, thank you, David. Thank you, Len. That was a terrific uh, uh, window into this whole process of Chinese companies, how they operate, the, the milieu in China and the challenges of listing in the US. Uh, to those in the audience, if you have a question, please, you can post it on chat. Um, but to get the uh, uh, conversation started, I'm, I'm curious if either of you or both of you would comment on how the Chinese government feels about Chinese companies doing IPOs abroad. One could think, imagine an, a situation where the government feels that companies that are not on the A list in terms of industry, if they want to go raise some money overseas, fine, let them do it. Uh, China cannot handle all of it right now, but when it can, maybe it'll all come back. Uh, one can also imagine officials saying, but this is a you know, potentially an avenue for capital flight. And you mentioned that that is often one of the motivations for listing in the US. How does the Chinese government feel about not using these IPOs to strengthen its own financial markets and allowing them to go uh, overseas? Well, then I, I think maybe you should answer that, but I do know that they have actually made it much easier for Chinese companies to go public in China, which mm -hmm. wasn't the case a few years ago. And and the and these the things that were the legislation that's being passed here has actually made it kind of more attractive to think about listing in China and Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank, thank, thank you. Maybe just share a few thoughts. So these these are all, of course my my personal opinions. I, I, I think I think at the other day it's, it's important not to uh, look look at this issue from a, a U.S. lens. I think uh, uh, we we might we 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 understand the the Chinese government regulator play an important role in in, in, in China. Uh, that that might be different from uh, other other countries and jurisdictions. But, but I think I think largely uh, the important thing is. At the end of the day, they very much understand the investors, right? Investors. So, so the, the, the companies are funded by overseas investors, and and also um, there are certain industry sector that that might be uh, well, more well received overseas outside China. Uh, the the the, gov the government actually um, uh, it it doesn't it doesn't uh, play a a tight fist role in terms of who should go, who should not go. I think one important factor is you have to look at China, even though it's a second biggest economy and the second biggest capital market, but it still required um, international investors and global capital market uh, to, to invest in China uh, through IPOs or other avenues to continue to uh, fuel the Chinese economy uh, growth. So, so one one of the things is the Chinese capital market itself cannot handle all the uh, requests, all the IPOs uh, that's needed. So, so, so clear, clearly, for example, I, I'll use Hong Kong as an example. Uh, I, I've done a project with the uh, Chinese regulator recently that uh, 
if you look at the Hong Kong market, uh, if you look at market cap or in terms of number of companies in the Hong Kong market, uh, 70%, roughly 70% of the companies listed in Hong Kong and in, in terms of market cap are Chinese companies. A Chinese company based in mainland, majority of the operations are in, in China. So the government is, is really uh, loosening policy in terms of uh, using Hong Kong to, to supplement uh, the two stock exchanges in, in mainland China. That's, that's, that's number one. Number two is David has, has mentioned, uh, sitting on the uh, IPO committee in the Shenzhen Stock Exchange. Uh, they, may, they make a listing rule uh, more focused on investors rather than a government uh, approval process. There's less threshold. Um, you have to meet a certain target. I think uh, that's working towards more of a transparency model, disclosure-based type of uh, system going forward. But, but clearly it's not going to be a big bang approach like the, the, the US because uh, you have to look at in investor education, also the, the quality and maturity of the institutional investors, also a governance framework. So, but clearly what we're, we're seeing is China's moving towards a, a, a transparency market-based uh, capital market uh, framework. Mm. I see our, our time is almost up. We have just a couple of minutes. So I'm going to ask one question that combines some of the questions that are on the chat. Mm -hmm. And that I think has to do with the a listing in the US, does it impose burdens on Chinese companies? And now David touched on it. He said that it does. Like for instance, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And tied to that is the escalating tension between the US and China, discouraging companies now from listing in the US. I think David mentioned there's actually a, a long line of companies looking to list. It appears as if uh, that is not the case, which is surprising. Uh, but I'll let you amplify, either of you. Yeah. I think that, uh, I don't, th don't think these are smaller companies. I don't think they are as affected by the, the government issue, by the problems we're having. They don't understand this PCAOB issue because it's really outside of their, their world. And the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, of course, everybody has to enforce that, and uh, and we do make sure that's in as part of basic governance. So I don't think enforcing it, I don't, I don't think that there's a lot of foreign bribes going on that uh, we don't at least they're not large enough, so we tend to see them. Uh, so I, right now, I think the the market is very good for IPOs. In fact, it, it's amazing how uh, I think of anything. There's probably even a lot more than have been mentioned. Nobody can really answer that question. But the, uh, there's also speculation that there's a lot more going in China into the Shenzhen market. One person said there could be a thousand. I mean, that's obviously it's just speculation. But I, I don't think it's really the, the tensions between US and China have not really caused a problem yet, I, at least in my view. Interesting. Uh, Len, would you like to add anything to that? No, I agree with uh, what 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 David has have said. I think uh, when you look at the majority of the uh, companies in in the pipeline are uh, small, medium, private companies, so they're not as uh, familiar with uh, the the PCOB uh, cross border issues. Uh, but but clearly, uh, they they have known about uh, uh, some some of the tensions uh, involved. I I I see one of the question is. Uh, how do you escalate? How, how do the escalation between U.S. and China affecting Chinese firm going public in the U.S. lately? So maybe I just comment on that, considering we're running out of time. Is this, this probably the, the best year in terms of number of IPO from China to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, mm -hmm. because there's so, so much uncertainties, because there's a pending interim rule and how PCLB tried to address the issues, companies are rushing to list in the U.S. before that windows. Uh, People might say windows get shut because of the rule might be issued down the road. So a lot of, a lot of US investors want to cash off on their China, China investment. So uh, I, I, if, you, if you do, uh, do a research, there's more Chinese IPOs in the first quarter this year than the previous three years. So uh, surprisingly, I mean, I, I was caught by surprise as well because of the tension and uncertainty, but we're seeing more IPOs uh, than, than previous years also. Uh, a, a firm like KPNG and other network uh, voucher firms, uh, we, we, we just don't have enough resources to meet the demand for the, 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 the Chinese IPOs at the moment. Fascinating. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much for that uh, 
introduction to this very interesting and important topic. Uh, I know That's that- uh, we're, yeah. al we're always ready to chat more about it. Len is a, a great conversationalist and I'm always happy to capture, to, to, to give you more stories. They're endless. Thank you, thank you, David. Uh, I mean, there are not many people who can speak uh, knowledgeably on this complex topic. And we are lucky to have two of you uh, to do this, uh, cover this topic for us. So thank you so much, uh, David. Thank you, Len. And Len is actually connecting with us from Beijing. So it's early morning for you. Uh, we really appreciate that. I think he's about to catch a flight to the US in a couple of hours. So uh, thank you, Len. Thank yeah. you, David. And thank you again to the audience for your uh, participation. And uh, many of you have come regularly to the series. We are going to have one more speaker in the series, Professor George Yip. We haven't quite fixed a date yet, but you'll hear from us when we when we do. Uh, we also have an event coming up next week on uh, Wednesday, but in the morning, and this is uh, not part of the China series, but through the center. And this is the topic is, will international tourism bounce back after COVID? And we're gonna have a conversation with uh, the Minister of uh, Industry and Tourism in Bahrain, and the Minister of Tourism from Indonesia. I will be moderating the conversation. I think that should be very interesting. It will be from 9 to 10, 8, 9 to 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Wednesday, May 19th. So with that, thank you all very much. Again, thank you, Len. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Magda and Sandrine, for putting all of this together. Good night. Goodbye. Thank you.